Section 47 of Unbeaten Tracks in Japan by Isabella L. Bird. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avai in October 2012. Letter 37, Part 2. I know clothing, for savages, is exceptionally good. In the winter it consists of one, two, or more coats of skin, with hoods of the same, to which the men add rude moccasins when they go out hunting. In summer they wear kimonos, or loose coats, made of cloth woven from the split bark of a forest tree. This is a durable and beautiful fabric in varial shades of natural buff, and somewhat resembles what is known to fancy workers as Panama canvas. Under this, a skin or bark cloth vest may or may not be worn. The men wear these coats, reaching a little below the knees, folded over from right to left, and confined at the waist by a narrow girdle of the same cloth, to which is attached a rude, dagger-shaped knife, with a carved and engraved wooden handle and sheath. Smoking is by no means a general practice, consequently the pipe and tobacco box are not as with the japanese a part of ordinary male attire tightly fitting leggings either of bark cloth or skin are worn by both sexes but neither shoes nor sandals the coat worn by the women reaches halfway between the knees and ankles and is quite loose and without a girdle it is fastened the whole way up to the collar bone and not only is the Aino woman completely covered, but she will not change one garment for another except alone or in the dark. Lately a Japanese woman at Sarufuto took an Aino woman into her house and insisted on her taking a bath, which she absolutely refused to do, till the bathhouse had been made quite private by means of screens. On the Japanese woman going back a little later to see what had become of her, she found her sitting in the water in her clothes, and on being remonstrated with, she said that the gods would be angry if they saw her without clothes. Many of the garments for holiday occasions are exceedingly handsome, being decorated with geometrical patterns in which the Greek fret takes part, in coarse blue cotton braided most dexterously with scarlet and white thread. Some of the handsomest take half a year to make. The masculine dress is completed by an apron of oblong shape decorated in the same elaborate manner. These handsome savages with their powerful physique look remarkably well in their best clothes. I have not seen a boy or girl above nine who is not thoroughly clothed. The jewels of the women are large hoop earrings of silver or pewter, with attachments of a classical pattern, and silver neck ornaments, and a few have brass bracelets soldered upon their arms. The women have a perfect passion for every hue of red, and I have made friends with them by dividing among them a large turkey-red silk handkerchief, strips of which are already being utilized for the ornamenting of coats. The houses in the five villages up here are very good. So they are at Horobetsu, but at Shiraoi, where the aborigines suffer from the close proximity of several grog shops, they are inferior. They differ in many ways from any that I have before seen, approaching most nearly to the grass houses of the natives of Hawaii. Custom does not appear to permit either of variety or innovations. In all, the style is the same, and the difference consists in the size and plenishings. The dwellings seem ill-fitted for a rigorous climate, but the same thing may be said of those of the Japanese. In their houses, as in their faces, the Ainos are more European than their conquerors, as they possess doorways, windows, central fireplaces, like those of the Highlanders of Scotland, and raised sleeping places. The usual appearance is that of a small house built on the end of a larger one. The small house is the vestibule or ante-room, and is entered by a low doorway screened by a heavy mat of reeds. It contains the large wooden mortar and pestle with two ends, used for pounding millet, a wooden receptacle for millet, nets or hunting gear, and some bundles of reeds for repairing roof or walls. This room never contains a window. 
from it the large room is entered by a doorway over which a heavy reed mat bound with hide invariably hangs this room in benri's case is thirty-five feet long by twenty-five feet broad another is forty-five feet square the smallest measures twenty feet by fifteen on entering one is much impressed by the great height and steepness of the roof altogether out of proportion to the height of the walls the frame of the house is of posts four feet ten inches high placed four feet apart and sloping slightly inwards the height of the walls is apparently regulated by that of the reeds of which only one length is used and which never exceed four feet ten inches the posts are scooped at the top and heavy poles resting on the scoops are laid along them to form the top of the wall the posts are again connected twice by slighter poles tied on horizontally the wall is double the outer part being formed of reeds tied very neatly to the framework in small regular bundles the inner layer or wall being made of reeds attached singly from the top of the pole which is secured to the top of the posts the framework of the roof rises to a height of twenty-two feet made like the rest of poles tied to a heavy and roughly hewn ridge beam at one end under the ridge beam there is a large triangular aperture for the exit of smoke two very stout roughly hewn beams cross the width of the house resting on the posts of the wall and on props let into the floor and a number of poles are laid at the same height by means of which a secondary roof formed of mats can be at once extemporized but this is only used for guests these poles answer the same purpose as shelves very great care is bestowed upon the outside of the roof which is a marvel of neatness and prettiness and has the appearance of a series of frills being thatched in ridges the ridge pole is very thickly covered and the thatch both there and at the corners is elaborately laced with a pattern in strong peeled twigs the poles which for much of the room run from wall to wall compel one to stoop to avoid fracturing one's skull and bringing down spears bows and arrows arrow traps and other primitive property the roof and rafters are black and shiny from wood smoke immediately under them at one end and one side are small square windows which are closed at night by wooden shutters which during the daytime hang by ropes nothing is a greater insult to an aino than to look in at his window on the left of the doorway is invariably a fixed wooden platform eighteen inches high and covered with a single mat which is the sleeping place the pillows are small stiff bolsters covered with ornamental matting if the family be large there are several of these sleeping platforms a pole runs horizontally at a fitting distance above the outside edge of each over which mats are thrown to conceal the sleepers from the rest of the room the inside half of these mats is plain but the outside which is seen from the room has a diamond pattern woven into it in dull reds and browns the whole floor is covered with a very coarse reed mat with interstices half an inch wide the fireplace which is six feet long is oblong above it on a very black and elaborate framework hangs a very black and shiny mat whose superfluous suit forms the basis of the stain used in tattooing and whose apparent purpose is to prevent the smoke ascending and to diffuse it equally throughout the room from this framework depends the great cooking pot which plays a most important part in aino economy household gods form an essential part of the furnishing of every house in this one at the left of the entrance there are ten white wands with shavings depending from the upper end stuck in the wall another projects from the window which faces the sunrise and the great god a white post two feet high with spirals of shavings depending from the top is always planted in the floor near the wall on the left side opposite the fire between the platform bed of the householder and the low broad shelf placed invariably on the same side and which is a singular feature of all aino houses coast and mountain down to the poorest containing as it does japanese curios 
many of them very valuable objects of antique art, though much destroyed by damp and dust. They are true curiosities in the dwellings of these northern aborigines, and look almost solemn ranged against a wall. In this house there are twenty-four lacquered urns, or tea-chests, or seats, each standing two feet high on four small legs, shod with engraved or filigree brass. Between these are eight lacquered tubs and a number of bowls and lacquer trays, and above are spares with inlaid handles and fine kaga and avata bowls. The lacquer is good, and several of the urns have daimyo's crests in gold upon them. One urn and a large covered bowl are beautifully inlaid with Venus's ear. The great urns are to be seen in every house, and in addition there are suits of inlaid armor and swords with inlaid hilts, engraved blades and repousse scabbards, for which a collector would give almost anything. No offers, however liberal, can tempt them to sell any of these antique possessions. They were presents, they say in their low musical voices. They were presents from those who were kind to our fathers. No, we cannot sell them, they were presents. And so gold lacquer and pearl inlaying, and gold niello work, and daimyo's crests in gold, continue to gleam in the smoky darkness of their huts. Some of these things were doubtless gifts to their fathers when they went to pay tribute to the representative of the shogun and the prince of Matsumae, soon after the conquest of Yezo. Others were probably gifts from samurai who took refuge here during the rebellion, and some must have been obtained by barter. They are the one possession which they will not barter for sake, and are only parted with in payment of fines at the command of a chief or as the dower of a girl. Except in the poorest houses, where the people can only afford to lay down a mat for a guest, they cover the coarse mat with fine ones on each side of the fire. These mats and the bark cloth are really their only manufactures. They are made of fine reeds, with a pattern in dull reds or browns, and are fourteen feet long by three feet six inches wide. It takes a woman eight days to make one of them. In every house there are one or two movable platforms six feet by four and fourteen inches high, which are placed at the head of the fireplace, and on which guests sit and sleep on a bearskin or a fine mat. In many houses there are broad seats a few inches high, on which the elder men sit cross-legged, as their custom is, not squatting Japanese fashion on the heels. A water tub always rests on a stand by the door, and the dried fish and venison, or bear, for daily use, hang from the rafters, as well as a few skins. Besides these things, there are a few absolute necessaries, lacquer or wooden bowls for food and sake, a chopping board and rude chopping knife, a cleft stick for burning strips of birch bark, a triply cleft stick for supporting the potsherd in which, on rare occasions, they burn a wick with oil, the component parts of their rude loom, the bark of which they make their clothes, the reeds of which they make their mats, and the inventory of the essentials of their life is nearly complete. No iron enters into the construction of their houses, its place being supplied by a remarkably tenacious fibre. I have before described the preparation of their food, which usually consists of a stew of abominable things. They eat salt and fresh fish, dried fish, seaweed, slugs, the various vegetables which grow in the wilderness of tall weeds which surrounds their villages, wild roots and berries, fresh and dried venison and bear. Their carnival consisting of fresh bear's flesh and sake, seaweed, mushrooms, and anything they can get, in fact, which is not poisonous, mixing everything up together. They use a wooden spoon for stirring and eat with chopsticks. They have only two regular meals a day, but eat very heartily. In addition to the eatables just mentioned, they have a thick soup made from a putty-like clay which is found in one or two of the valleys. This is boiled with the bulb of a wild lily, and, after much of the clay has been allowed to settle, 
the liquid, which is very thick, is poured off. In the north, a valley where this earth is found is called Tsie Toinai, literally, Eat Earth Valley. The men spent the autumn, winter, and spring in hunting deer and bears. Part of their tribute or taxes is paid in skins, and they subsist on the dried meat. Up to about this time, the Ainos have obtained these beasts by means of poisoned arrows, arrow traps and pitfalls, but the Japanese government has prohibited the use of poison and arrow traps, and these men say that hunting is becoming extremely difficult, as the wild animals are driven back farther and farther into the mountains by the sound of the guns. However, they add significantly, the eyes of the Japanese government are not in every place. Their bows are only three feet long and are made of stout saplings with the bark on, and there is no attempt to render them light or shapely at the ends. The wood is singularly inelastic. The arrows, of which I have obtained a number, are very peculiar and are made in three pieces, the point consisting of a sharpened piece of bone with an elongated cavity on one side for the reception of the poison. This point, or head, is very slightly fastened by a lashing of bark to a fusiform piece of bone about four inches long, which is in its turn lashed to a shaft about fourteen inches long, the other end of which is sometimes equipped with a triple feather, and sometimes is not. The poison is placed in the elongated cavity in the head in a very soft state, and hardens afterwards. In some of the arrowheads, fully half a teaspoonful of the paste is inserted. From the nature of the very slight lashings which attach the arrowhead to the shaft, it constantly remains fixed in the slight wound that it makes, while the shaft falls off. Pipichari has given me a small quantity of the poisonous paste, and has also taken me to see the plant from the root of which it is made, the Aconitum japonicum, a monk's hood, whose tall spikes of blue flowers are brightening the brushwood in all directions. The root is pounded into a pulp, mixed with a reddish earth like an iron ore pulverized, and again with animal fat, before being placed in the arrow. It has been said that the poison is prepared for use by being buried in the earth, but Benneri says that this is needless. They claim for it that a single wound kills a bear in ten minutes, but that the flesh is not rendered unfit for eating, though they take the precaution of cutting away a considerable quantity of it round the wound. Dr. Eldridge, formerly of Hakodate, obtained a small quantity of the poison, and, after trying some experiments with it, came to the conclusion that it is less virulent than other poisons employed for a like purpose, as by the natives of Java, the Bushmen, and certain tribes of the Amazon and Orinoco. The Ainos say that if a man is accidentally wounded by a poisoned arrow, the only cure is immediate excision of the part. I do not wonder that the government has prohibited arrow traps, for they made locomotion unsafe, and it is still unsafe a little farther north, where the hunters are more out of observation than here. The traps consist of a large bow with a poisoned arrow, fixed in such a way that when the bear walks over a cord which is attached to it, he is simultaneously transfixed. I have seen as many as fifty in one house. The simple contrivance for inflicting this silent death is most ingenious. The women are occupied all day, as I have before said. They look cheerful and even merry when they smile, and are not like the Japanese, prematurely old, partly perhaps because their houses are well ventilated, and the use of charcoal is unknown. I do not think that they undergo the unmitigated drudgery which falls to the lot of most savage women, though they work hard. The men do not like them to speak to strangers, however, and say that their place is to work and rear children. They eat of the same food, and at the same time as the men, laugh and talk before them, and receive equal support and respect in old age. They sell mats and bark cloth in the peace, and made up when they can, and their husbands do not take their earnings from them. All I know women understand the making of bark cloth. 
the men bring in the bark in strips five feet long having removed the outer coating this inner bark is easily separated into several thin layers which are split into very narrow strips by the older women very neatly knotted and wound into balls weighing about a pound each no preparation of either the bark or the thread is required to fit it for weaving but i observe that some of the women steep it in a decoction of a bark which produces a brown dye to deepen the buff tint the loom is so simple that i almost fear to represent it as complicated by description it consists of a stout hook fixed in the floor to which the threads of the far end of the web are secured a cord fastening the near end to the waist of the worker who supplies by dexterous rigidity the necessary tension a frame like a comb resting on the ankles through which the threads pass a hollow roll for keeping the upper and under threads separate a spatula shaped shuttle of engraved wood and the roller on which the cloth is rolled as it is made the length of the web is fifteen feet and the width of the cloth fifteen inches it is woven with great regularity and the knots in the thread are carefully kept on the under side it is a very slow and fatiguing process and a woman cannot do much more than a foot a day the weaver sits on the floor with the whole arrangement attached to her waist, and the loom, if such it may be called, on her ankles. It takes long practice before she can supply the necessary tension by spinal rigidity. As the work proceeds, she drags herself almost imperceptibly nearer the hook. In this house and other large ones, two or three women bring in their webs in the morning, fix their hooks, and weave all day, while others who have not equal advantages put their hooks in the ground and weave in the sunshine the web and loom can be bundled up in two minutes and carried away quite as easily as a knitted soft blanket it is the simplest and perhaps the most primitive form of hand loom and comb shuttle and roll are all easily fashioned with an ordinary knife end of section forty seven of unbeaten tracks in japan by isabella l bird this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by avai in october two thousand and twelve letter thirty seven part three there cannot be anything more vague and destitute of cohesion than i know religious notions with the exception of the hill shrines of japanese construction dedicated to yoshitsune they have no temples and they have neither priests sacrifices nor worship apparently through all traditional time their cultus has been the rudest and most primitive form of nature worship the attaching of a vague sacredness to trees rivers rocks and mountains and of vague notions of power for good or evil to the sea the forest the fire and the sun and moon i cannot make out that they possess a trace of the deification of ancestors though their rude nature worship may well have been the primitive form of japanese shinto the solitary exception to their adoration of animate and inanimate nature appears to be the reverence paid to yoshitsune to whom they believe they are greatly indebted and who it is supposed by some will yet interfere on their behalf their gods that is the outward symbols of their religion corresponding most likely with the shinto gohei are wands and posts of peeled wood whittled nearly to the top from which the pendant shavings fall down in white curls these are not only set up in their houses sometimes to the number of twenty but on precipices banks of rivers and streams and mountain passes and such wands are thrown into the rivers as the boatmen descend rapids and dangerous places since my baggage horse fell over an acclivity on the trail from sarufuto four such wands have been placed there it is nonsense to write of the religious ideas of a people who have none and of beliefs among people who are merely adult children the traveller who formulates an aino creed must evolve it from his inner consciousness i have taken infinite trouble to learn from themselves what their religious notions are 
and Shinondi tells me that they have told me all they know, and the whole sum is a few vague fears and hopes, and a suspicion that there are things outside themselves more powerful than themselves, whose good influences may be obtained, or whose evil influences may be averted by libations of sake. The word worship is in itself misleading. When I use it of these savages, it simply means libations of sake, waving bowls and waving hands, without any spiritual act of deprecation or supplication. In such a sense, and such alone, they worship the sun and moon, but not the stars, the forest and the sea. The wolf, the black snake, the owl, and several other beasts and birds have the word kamoi, god, attached to them, as the wolf is the howling god, the owl the bird of the gods, a black snake the raven god, but none of these things are now worshipped, wolf worship having quite lately died out. Thunder, the voice of the gods, inspires some fear. The sun, they say, is their best god, and the fire their next best, obviously the divinities from whom their greatest benefits are received. Some idea of gratitude pervades their rude notions, as in the case of the worship paid to Yoshitsune, and it appears in one of the rude recitations chanted at the Saturnalia, which in several places conclude the hunting and fishing seasons. To the sea which nourishes us, to the forest which protects us, we present our grateful thanks. You are two mothers that nourish the same child, do not be angry if we leave one to go to the other. The Ainos will always be the pride of the forest and of the sea. The solitary act of sacrifice which they perform is the placing of a worthless dead bird, something like a sparrow, near one of their peeled wands, where it is left till it reaches an advanced stage of putrefaction. To drink for the god is the chief act of worship, and thus drunkenness and religion are inseparably connected, as the more sake the Ainos drink, the more devout they are, and the better pleased are the gods. It does not appear that anything but sake is of sufficient value to please the god. The libations to the fire and the peeled post are never omitted, and are always accompanied by the inward waving of the sake bowls. The peculiarity which distinguishes this rude mythology is the worship of the bear, the Yezo bear being one of the finest of his species, but it is impossible to understand the feelings by which it is prompted, for they worship it after their fashion and set up its head in their villages, yet they trap it, kill it, eat it, and sell its skin. There is no doubt that this wild beast inspires more of the feeling which prompts worship than the inanimate forces of nature, and the Ainos may be distinguished as bear worshippers, and their greatest religious festival or Saturnalia as the festival of the bear. Gentle and peaceable as they are, they have a great admiration for fierceness and courage, and the bear, which is the strongest, fiercest, and most courageous animal known to them, has probably in all ages inspired them with veneration. Some of their rude chants are in praise of the bear, and their highest eulogy on a man is to compare him to a bear. Thus Shinondi said of Benri, the chief, He is as strong as a bear, and the old fate praising Pipichari called him the young bear. In all Aino villages, especially near the chief's house, there are several tall poles with the fleshless skull of a bear on the top of each, and in most there is also a large cage, made gridiron fashion, of stout timbers, and raised two or three feet from the ground. At the present time such cages contain young but well-grown bears, captured when quite small in the early spring. After the capture, the bear cub is introduced into a dwelling house, generally that of the chief or sub-chief, where it is suckled by a woman and played with by the children till it grows too big and rough for domestic ways, and is placed in a strong cage in which it is fed and cared for, as I understand, till the autumn of the following year, when, being strong and well-grown, the festival of the bear is celebrated. 
the customs of this festival vary considerably and the manner of the bear's death differs among the mountain and coast ainos but everywhere there is a great gathering of the people and it is the occasion of a great feast accompanied with much sake and a curious dance in which men alone take part yells and shouts are used to excite the bear and when he becomes much agitated a chief shoots him with an arrow inflicting a slight wound which maddens him on which the bars of the cage are raised and he springs forth very furious at this stage the ainos run upon him with various weapons each one striving to inflict a wound as it brings luck to draw his blood as soon as he falls down exhausted his head is cut off and the weapons with which he has been wounded are offered to it and he is asked to avenge himself upon them afterwards the carcass amidst the frenzied uproar is distributed among the people and amidst feasting and riot the head placed upon a pole is worshipped that is it receives libations of sake and the festival closes with general intoxication in some villages it is customary for the foster mother of the bear to utter piercing wails while he is delivered to his murderers and after he is slain to beat each one of them with a branch of a tree afterwards at uzu on volcano bay the old man told me that at their festival they dispatched the bear after a different manner on letting it loose from the cage two men seize it by the ears and others simultaneously place a long stout pole across the nape of its neck upon which a number of ainos mount and after a prolonged struggle the neck is broken as the bear is seen to approach his end they shout in chorus we kill you o bear come back soon into an aino when a bear is trapped or wounded by an arrow the hunters go through an apologetic or propitiatory ceremony they appear to have certain rude ideas of metempsychosis as is evident by the uzu prayer to the bear and certain rude traditions but whether these are indigenous or have arisen by contact with buddhism at a later period is impossible to say they have no definite ideas concerning a future state and the subject is evidently not a pleasing one to them such notions as they have are few and confused some think that the spirits of their friends go into wolves and snakes others that they wander about the forests and they are much afraid of ghosts a few think that they go to a good or bad place according to their deeds but shinondi said and there was an infinite pathos in his words how can we know no one ever came back to tell us on asking him what were bad deeds he said being bad to parents stealing and telling lies the future however does not occupy any place in their thoughts and they can hardly be said to believe in the immortality of the soul though their fear of ghosts shows that they recognize a distinction between body and spirit their social customs are very simple girls never marry before the age of seventeen or men before twenty-one when a man wishes to marry he thinks of some particular girl and asks the chief if he may ask for her if leave is given either through a go-between or personally he asks her father for her and if he consents the bridegroom gives him a present usually a japanese curio this constitutes betrothal and the marriage which immediately follows is celebrated by carousals and the drinking of much sake the bride receives as her dowry her earrings and a highly ornamented kimono it is an essential that the husband provides a house to which to take his wife each couple lives separately and even the eldest son does not take his bride to his father's house polygamy is only allowed in two cases the chief may have three wives but each must have her separate house benri has two wives but it appears that he took the second because the first was childless the uzu ainos told me that among the tribes of volcano bay polygamy is not practised even by the chiefs it is also permitted in the case of a childless wife but there is no instance of it in biratori and the men say that they prefer to have one wife as two quarrel 
widows are allowed to marry again with the chief's consent but among these mountain ainos a woman must remain absolutely secluded within the house of her late husband for a period varying from six to twelve months only going to the door at intervals to throw sake to the right and left a man secludes himself similarly for thirty days so greatly do the customs vary that round volcano bay i found that the period of seclusion for a widow is only thirty days and for a man twenty-five but that after a father's death the house in which he has lived is burned down after the thirty days of seclusion and the widow and her children go to a friend's house for three years after which the house is rebuilt on its former site if a man does not like his wife by obtaining the chief's consent he can divorce her but he must send her back to her parents with plenty of good clothes but divorce is impracticable where there are children and is rarely if ever practised conjugal fidelity is a virtue among Aino women but custom provides that in case of unfaithfulness the injured husband may bestow his wife upon her paramour if he be an unmarried man in which case the chief fixes the amount of damages which the paramour must pay and these are usually valuable japanese curios the old and blind people are entirely supported by their children and receive until their dying day filial reverence and obedience if one man steals from another he must return what he has taken and give the injured man a present besides the value of which is fixed by the chief their mode of living you already know as i have shared it and am still receiving their hospitality custom enjoins the exercise of hospitality on every i know they receive all strangers as they received me giving them of their best placing them in the most honourable place bestowing gifts upon them and when they depart furnishing them with cakes of boiled millet they have few amusements except certain feasts their dance which they have just given in my honour is slow and mournful and their songs are chants or recitative they have a musical instrument something like a guitar with three five or six strings which are made from sinews of whales cast upon the shore they have another which is believed to be peculiar to themselves consisting of a thin piece of wood about five inches long and two and a half inches broad with a pointed wooden tong about two lines in breadth and sixteen in length fixed in the middle and grooved on three sides the wood is held before the mouth and the tongue is set in motion by the vibration of the breath in singing its sound though less penetrating is as discordant as that of a jew's harp which it somewhat resembles one of the men used it as an accompaniment of a song but they are unwilling to part with them as they say that it is very seldom that they can find a piece of wood which will bear the fine splitting necessary for the tongue they are a most courteous people among each other the salutations are frequent on entering a house on leaving it on meeting on the road on receiving anything from the hand of another and on receiving a kind or complimentary speech they do not make any acknowledgments of this kind to the women however the common salutation consists in extending the hands and waving them inwards once or oftener and stroking the beard the formal one in raising the hands with an inward curve to the level of the head two or three times lowering them and rubbing them together the ceremony concluding with stroking the beard several times the latter and more formal mode of salutation is offered to the chief and by the young to the old the women have no manners they have no medicine men and although they are aware of the existence of healing herbs they do not know their special virtues or the manner of using them dried and pounded bear's liver is their specific and they place much reliance on it in colic and other pains they are a healthy race in this village of three hundred souls there are no chronically ailing people nothing but one case of bronchitis and some cutaneous maladies among children neither is there any case of deformity in this and five other large villages which i have visited 
except that of a girl who has one leg slightly shorter than the other they ferment a kind of intoxicating liquor from the root of a tree and also from their own millet and japanese rice but japanese sake is the one thing that they care about they spend all their gains upon it and drink it in enormous quantities it represents to them all the good of which they know or can conceive beastly intoxication is the highest happiness to which these poor savages aspire and the condition is sanctified to them under the fiction of drinking to the gods men and women alike indulge in this vice a few however like pipichari abstain from it totally taking the bowl in their hands making the libations to the gods and then passing it on i asked pipichari why he did not take sake and he replied with a truthful terseness because it makes men like dogs except the chief who has two horses they have no domestic animals except very large yellow dogs which are used in hunting but are never admitted within the houses the habits of the people though by no means destitute of decency and propriety are not cleanly the women bathe their hands once a day but any other washing is unknown they never wash their clothes and wear the same by day and night i am afraid to speculate on the condition of their wealth of coal-black hair they may be said to be very dirty as dirty fully as masses of our people at home their houses swarm with fleas but they are not worse in this respect than the japanese yadoyas the mountain villages have however the appearance of extreme cleanliness being devoid of litter heaps puddles and untidiness of all kinds and there are no unpleasant odours inside or outside the houses as they are well ventilated and smoked and the salt fish and meat are kept in the go-downs the hair and beards of the old men instead of being snowy as they ought to be are yellow from smoke and dirt they have no mode of computing time and do not know their own ages to them the past is dead yet like other conquered and despised races they cling to the idea that in some far-off age they were a great nation they have no traditions of internecine strife and the art of war seems to have been lost long ago i asked benri about this matter and he says that formerly ainos fought with spears and knives as well as with bows and arrows but that yoshitsune the hero god forbade war for ever and since then the two-edged spear with a shaft nine feet long has only been used in hunting bears the japanese government of course exercises the same authority over the ainos as over its other subjects but probably it does not care to interfere in domestic or tribal matters and within this outside limit despotic authority is vested in the chiefs the ainos live in village communities and each community has its own chief who is its lord paramount it appears to me that this chieftainship is but an expansion of the paternal relation and that all the village families are ruled as a unit benri in whose house i am is the chief of biratori and is treated by all with very great deference of manner the office is nominally for life but if a chief becomes blind or too infirm to go about he appoints a successor if he has a smart son who he thinks will command the respect of the people he appoints him but if not he chooses the most suitable man in the village the people are called upon to approve the choice but the ratification is never refused the office is not hereditary anywhere benri appears to exercise the authority of a very strict father his manner to all the men is like that of a master to slaves and they bow whenever they speak to him no one can marry without his approval if any one builds a house he chooses the site he has absolute jurisdiction in civil and criminal cases unless which is very rare the letter should be of sufficient magnitude to be reported to the imperial officials he compels restitution of stolen property and in all cases fixes the fines which are to be paid by delinquents he also fixes the hunting arrangements and the festivals 
the younger men were obviously much afraid of incurring his anger in his absence an eldest son does not appear to be as among the japanese a privileged person he does not necessarily inherit the house and curios the latter are not divided but go with the house to the son whom the father regards as being the smartest formal adoption is practised pipichari is an adopted son and is likely to succeed to benri's property to the exclusion of his own children i cannot get at the word which is translated smartness but i understand it as meaning general capacity the chief as i have mentioned before is allowed three wives among the mountain ainos otherwise authority seems to be his only privilege the ainos have a singular dread of snakes even their bravest fly from them one man says that it is because they know of no cure for their bite but there is something more than this for they flee from snakes which they know to be harmless they have an equal dread of their dead death seems to them very specially the shadow feared of man when it comes which is usually from bronchitis in old age the corpse is dressed in its best clothing and laid upon a shelf for from one to three days in the case of a woman her ornaments are buried with her and in that of a man his knife and sake stick and if he were a smoker his smoking apparatus the corpse is sewn up with these things in a mat and being slung on poles is carried to a solitary grave where it is laid in a recumbent position nothing will induce an aino to go near a grave even if a valuable bird or animal falls near one he will not go to pick it up a vague dread is for ever associated with the departed and no dream of paradise ever lights for the aino the stygian shades benri is for an aino intelligent two years ago mr denning of hakodate came up here and told him that there was but one god who made us all to which the shrewd old man replied if the god who made you made us how is it that you are so different you so rich we so poor on asking him about the magnificent pieces of lacquer and inlaying which adorn his curio shelf he said that they were his father's grandfather's and great-grandfather's at least and he thinks they were gift from the daimyo of matsumae soon after the conquest of yezo he is a grand-looking man in spite of the havoc wrought by his intemperate habits there is plenty of room in the house and this morning when i asked him to show me the use of the spear he looked a truly magnificent savage stepping well back with the spear in rest and then springing forward for the attack his arms and legs turning into iron the big muscles standing out in knots his frame quivering with excitement the thick hair falling back in masses from his brow and the fire of the chase in his eye i trembled for my boy who was the object of the imaginary onslaught the passion of sport was so admirably acted as i write seven of the older men are sitting by the fire their great beards fall to their waists in rippled masses and the slight baldness of age not only gives them a singularly venerable appearance but enhances the beauty of their lofty brows i took a rough sketch of one of the handsomest and showing it to him asked if he would have it but instead of being amused or pleased he showed symptoms of fear and asked me to burn it saying it would bring him bad luck and he should die however ito pacified him and he accepted it after a chinese character which is understood to mean good luck had been written upon it but all the others begged me not to make pictures of them except pipichari who lies at my feet like a stag hound the profusion of black hair and a curious intensity about their eyes coupled with the hairy limbs and singularly vigorous physique give them a formidably savage appearance but the smile full of sweetness and light in which both eyes and mouth bear part and the low musical voice softer and sweeter than anything i have previously heard make me at times forget that they are savages at all 
the venerable look of these old men harmonizes with the singular dignity and courtesy of their manners but as i look at the grand heads and reflect that the ainos have never shown any capacity and are merely adult children they seem to suggest water on the brain rather than intellect i am more and more convinced that the expression of their faces is european it is truthful straightforward manly but both it and the tone of voice are strongly tinged with pathos before these elders benri asked me in a severe tone if i had been annoyed in any way during his absence he feared he said that the young men and the women would crowd about me rudely i made a complimentary speech in return and all the ancient hands were waved and the venerable beards were stroked in acknowledgment these ainos doubtless stand high among uncivilized peoples they are however as completely irreclaimable as the wildest of nomad tribes and contact with civilization where it exists only debases them several young ainos were sent to tokyo and educated and trained in various ways but as soon as they returned to yezo they relapsed into savagery retaining nothing but a knowledge of japanese they are charming in many ways but make one sad too by their stupidity apathy and hopelessness and all the sadder that their numbers appear to be again increasing and as their physique is very fine there does not appear to be a prospect of the race dying out at present they are certainly superior to many aborigines as they have an approach to domestic life they have one word for house and another for home and one word for husband approaches very nearly to houseband truth is of value in their eyes and this in itself raises them above some peoples infanticide is unknown and aged parents receive filial reverence kindness and support while in their social and domestic relations there is much that is praiseworthy i must conclude this letter abruptly as the horses are waiting and i must cross the rivers if possible before the bursting of an impending storm i l b end of section forty eight forty nine of unbeaten tracks in japan by isabella l bird this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avai in October 2012. Letter 38. Sarufuto, Yezo, August 27. I left the Ainos yesterday with real regret, though I must confess that sleeping in one's clothes and the lack of ablutions are very fatiguing. Benri's two wives spent the early morning in the laborious operation of grinding millet into coarse flour, and before I departed, as their custom is, they made a paste of it, rolled it with their unclean fingers into well-shaped cakes, boiled them in the unwashed pot in which they make their stew of abominable things, and presented them to me on a lacquer tray they were distressed that i did not eat their food and a woman went to a village at some distance and brought me some venison fat as a delicacy all those of whom i had seen much came to wish me good-bye and they brought so many presents including a fine bearskin that i should have needed an additional horse to carry them had i accepted but one half I rode twelve miles through the forest to Mombetsu, where I intended to spend Sunday, but I had the worst horse I ever rode, and we took five hours. The day was dull and sad, threatening a storm, and when we got out of the forest upon a sand hill covered with oak scrub, we encountered a most furious wind. Among the many views which I have seen, that is one to be remembered below lay a bleached and bare sand-hill with a few grey houses huddled in its miserable shelter and a heaped-up shore of grey sand on which a brown grey sea was breaking with clash and boom in long white ragged lines with all beyond a confusion of surf surge and mist with driving brown clouds mingling sea and sky and all between showing only in glimpses amidst scuds of sand 
at a house in the scrub a number of men were drinking sake with much uproar and a superb-looking aino came out staggered a few yards and then fell backwards among the weeds a picture of debasement i forgot to tell you that before i left biratori i inveighed to the assembled ainos against the practice and consequences of sake drinking and was met with the reply we must drink to the gods or we shall die but pipichari said you say that which is good let us give sake to the gods but not drink it for which bold speech he was severely rebuked by benri mombetsu is a stormily situated and most wretched cluster of twenty-seven decayed houses some of them aino and some japanese the fish oil and seaweed fishing trades are in brisk operation there now for a short time and a number of aino and japanese strangers are employed the boats could not get out because of the surf and there was a drunken debauch the whole place smelt of sake tipsy men were staggering about and falling flat on their backs to lie there like dogs till they were sober i know women were vainly endeavouring to drag their drunken lords home and men of both races were reduced to a beastly equality i went to the yadoya where i intended to spend sunday but besides being very dirty and forlorn it was the very centre of the sake traffic and in its open space there were men in all stages of riotous and stupid intoxication it was a sad scene yet one to be matched in a hundred places in scotland every saturday afternoon i am told by the kocho here that an aino can drink four or five times as much as a japanese without being tipsy so for each tipsy i know there had been an outlay of six shillings or seven shillings for sake is eight pence a cup here i had some tea and eggs in the daidokoro and altered my plans altogether on finding that if i proceeded farther round the east coast as i intended i should run the risk of several days detention on the banks of numerous bad rivers if rain came on by which i should run the risk of breaking my promise to deliver ito to mr mary's by a given day i do not surrender this project however without an equivalent for i intend to add one hundred miles to my journey by taking an almost disused track round volcano bay and visiting the coast ainos of a very primitive region ito is very much opposed to this thinking that he has made a sufficient sacrifice of personal comfort at biratori and plies me with stories such as that there are many bad rivers to cross that the track is so worn as to be impassable that there are no yadoyas and that at the government offices we shall neither get rice nor eggs an old man who has turned back unable to get horses is made responsible for these stories the machinations are very amusing ito was much smitten with the daughter of the housemaster at murodan and left some things in her keeping and the desire to see her again is at the bottom of his opposition to the other route monday the horse could not or would not carry me farther than mombetsu so sending the baggage on i walked through the oak wood and enjoyed its silent solitude in spite of the sad reflections upon the enslavement of the ainos to sake i spent yesterday quietly in my old quarters with a fearful storm of wind and rain outside pipichari appeared at noon nominally to bring news of the sick woman who is recovering and to have his nearly healed foot bandaged again but really to bring me a knife sheath which he has carved for me he lay on the mat in the corner of my room most of the afternoon and i got a great many more words from him the housemaster who is the kocho of sarufuto paid me a courteous visit and in the evening sent to say that he would be very glad of some medicine for he was very ill and going to have fever he had caught a bad cold and sore throat had bad pains in his limbs and was bemoaning himself ruefully to pacify his wife who was very sorry for him i gave him some cockles pills and the trapper's remedy of a pint of hot water with a pinch of cayenne pepper and left him moaning and bundled up under a pile of futons in a nearly hermetically sealed room with a hibachi of charcoal vitiating the air 
this morning when i went and inquired after him in a properly concerned tone his wife told me very gleefully that he was quite well and had gone out and had left twenty-five sen for some more of the medicines that i have given him so with great gravity i put up some of duncan and flockhart's most pungent cayenne pepper and showed her how much to use she was not content however without some of the cockles a single box of which has performed six of those miraculous cures which rejoice the hearts and fill the pockets of patent medicine makers i l b end of section forty nine of unbeaten tracks in japan by isabella l bird this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by avai in october two thousand and twelve letter thirty nine part one old mororan volcano bay yezo september second after the storm on sunday monday was a grey still tender day and the ranges of wooded hills were bathed in the richest indigo colouring a canter of seventeen miles among the damask roses on a very rough horse only took me to yubetsu whose indescribable loneliness fascinated me into spending a night there again and encountering a wild clatter of wind and rain and another canter of seven miles the next morning took me to tomakomai where i rejoined my kuruma and after a long delay three trotting ainos took me to shiraoi where the clear shining after rain and the mountains against the lemon-coloured sky were extremely beautiful but the pacific was as unrestful as a guilty thing and its crash and clamour and the severe cold fatigued me so much that i did not pursue my journey the next day and had the pleasure of a flying visit from mr von siebold and count diesbach who bestowed a chicken upon me i like shiraoi very much and if i were stronger would certainly make it a basis for exploring a part of the interior in which there is much to reward the explorer obviously the changes in this part of yezo have been comparatively recent and the energy of the force which has produced them is not yet extinct the land has gained from the sea along the whole of this part of the coast to the extent of two or three miles the old beach with its bays and headlands being a marked feature of the landscape this new formation appears to be a vast bed of pumice covered by a thin layer of vegetable mould which cannot be more than fifty years old this pumice fell during the eruption of the volcano of tarumai which is very near shiraoi and is also brought down in large quantities from the interior hills and valleys by the numerous rivers besides being washed up by the sea at the last eruption pumice fell over this region of yezo to a medium depth of three feet six inches in nearly all the rivers good sections of the formation may be seen in their deeply cleft banks broad light-coloured bands of pumice with a few inches of rich black vegetable soil above and several feet of black sea-sand below during a freshet which occurred the first night i was at shiraoi a single stream covered a piece of land with pumice to the depth of nine inches being the wash from the hills of the interior in a course of less than fifteen miles looking inland the volcano of tarumai with a bare grey top and a blasted forest on its sides occupies the right of the picture to the left and inland are mountains within mountains tumbled together in most picturesque confusion densely covered with forest and cleft by magnificent ravines here and there opening out into narrow valleys the whole of the interior is jungle penetrable for a few miles by shallow and rapid rivers and by nearly smothered trails made by the ainos in search of game the general lie of the country made me very anxious to find out whether a much broken ridge lying among the mountains is or is not a series of tufa cones of ancient date and applying for a good horse and aino guide on horseback i left ito to amuse himself and spent much of a splendid day in investigations 
and in attempting to get round the back of the volcano and up its inland side there is a great deal to see and learn here oh that i had strength after hours of most tedious and exhausting work i reached a point where there were several great fissures emitting smoke and steam with occasional subterranean detonations these were on the side of a small flank crack which was smoking heavily there was light pumice everywhere but nothing like recent lava or scoriae one fissure was completely lined with exquisite acicular crystals of sulphur which perished with a touch lower down there were two hot springs with a deposit of sulphur round their margins and bubbles of gas which from its strong garlicky smell i suppose to be sulphuretted hydrogen farther progress in that direction was impossible without the force of pioneers i put my arm down several deep crevices which were at an altitude of only about five hundred feet and had to withdraw it at once owing to the great heat in which some beautiful specimens of tropical ferns were growing at the same height i came to a hot spring hot enough to burst one of my thermometers which was graduated above the boiling point of fahrenheit and tying up an egg in a pocket handkerchief and holding it by a stick in the water it was hard boiled in eight and a half minutes the water evaporated without leaving a trace of deposit on the handkerchief and there was no crust round its margin it boiled and bubbled with great force three hours more of exhausting toil which almost knocked up the horses brought us to the apparent ridge and i was delighted to find that it consisted of a large lateral range of tufa cones which i estimate as being from two hundred to three hundred fifty or even four hundred feet high they are densely covered with trees of considerable age and a rich deposit of mould but their conical form is still admirably defined an hour of very severe work and energetic use of the knife on the part of the Aino took me to the top of one of these through a mass of entangled and gigantic vegetation, and I was amply repaid by finding a deep, well-defined crateriform cavity of great depth, with its side richly clothed with vegetation, closely resembling some of the old cones in the island of Kauai this cone is partially girdled by a stream which in one place has cut through a bank of both red and black volcanic ash all the usual phenomena of volcanic regions are probably to be met with north of shiraoi and i hope they will at some future time be made the object of careful investigation in spite of the desperate and almost overwhelming fatigue i have enjoyed few things more than that exploring expedition if the japanese have no one to talk to they croon hideous discords to themselves and it was a relief to leave ito behind and get away with an aino who was at once silent trustworthy and faithful two bright rivers bubbling over beds of red pebbles run down to shiraoi out of the back country and my directions which were translated to the aino were to follow up one of these and go into the mountains in the direction of one i pointed out till i said shiraoi it was one of those exquisite mornings which are seen sometimes in the scotch highlands before rain with intense clearness and visibility a blue atmosphere a cloudless sky blue summits heavy dew and glorious sunshine and under these circumstances scenery beautiful in itself became entrancing the trailers are so formidable that we had to stoop over our horses necks at all times and with pushing back branches and guarding my face from slaps and scratches my big dog-skin gloves were literally frayed off and some of the skin of my hands and face in addition so that i returned with both bleeding and swelled it wasn't the return ride fortunately that in stopping to escape one great liana the loop of another grazed my nose and being unable to check my unbroken horse instantaneously the loop caught me by the throat nearly strangled me and in less time than it takes to tell it i was drawn over the back of the saddle and found myself lying on the ground jammed between a tree and the hind leg of the horse which was quietly feeding the aino whose face was very badly scratched missed me came back said never a word helped me up brought me some water in a leaf brought my hat 
and we rode on again. I was little the worse for the fall, but on borrowing a looking-glass I see not only scratches and abrasions all over my face, but a livid mark round my throat as if I had been hung. The Aino left portions of his bushy locks on many of the branches. You would have been amused to see me in this forest, preceded by this hairy and formidable-looking savage, who was dressed in a coat of skins with the fur outside, seated on the top of a pack-saddle covered with a deer-hide, and with his hairy legs crossed over the horse's neck, a fashion in which the Ainos ride any horses over any ground, with the utmost serenity. It was a wonderful region for beauty. I have not seen so beautiful a view in Japan as from the river-bed from which I had the first near view of the grand assemblage of tufa cones, covered with an ancient vegetation, backed by high mountains of volcanic origin, on whose ragged crests the red ash was blazing vermilion against the blue sky, with a foreground of bright waters flashing through a primeval forest. The banks of these steams were deeply excavated by the heavy rains, and sometimes we had to jump three and even four feet out of the forest into the river, and as much up again, fording the Shiraoi River only more than twenty times, and often making a pathway of its treacherous bed and rushing waters, because the forest was impassable from the great size of the prostrate trees. The horses look at these jumps, hold back, try to turn, and then, making up their minds, suddenly plunge up or down. When the last vestige of a trail disappeared, I signed to the Aino to go on, and our subsequent exploration was all done at the rate of about a mile an hour. On the openings the grass grows stiff and strong to the height of eight feet, with its soft reddish plumes wazing in the breeze. The Aino first forced his horse through it, but of course it closed again, so that constantly when he was close in front, I was only aware of his proximity by the tinkling of his horse's bells, for I saw nothing of him or of my own horse, except the horn of my saddle. We tumbled into holes often, and as easily tumbled out of them, but once we both went down in the most unexpected manner into what must have been an old bear trap, both going over our horses' heads, the horses and ourselves struggling together in a narrow space in a mist of grassy plumes, and, being unable to communicate with my guide, the sense of the ridiculous situation was so overpowering that, even in the midst of the mishap, I was exhausted with laughter, though not a little bruised. It was very hard to get out of that pitfall, and I hope I shall never get into one again. It is not the first occasion on which I have been glad that the Yezo horses are shoeless. It was through this long grass that we fought our way to the tufa cones, with the red ragged crests against the blue sky. The scenery was magnificent, and after getting so far I longed to explore the sources of the rivers, but besides the many difficulties the day was far spent. I was also too weak for any energetic undertaking, Yet I felt an intuitive perception of the passion and fascination of exploring, and understand how people could give up their lives to it. I turned away from the tufa cones and the glory of the ragged crests very sadly, to ride a tired horse through great difficulties, and the animal was so thoroughly done up that I had to walk, or rather wade, for the last hour, and it was nightfall when I returned to find that Ito had packed up all my things, had been waiting ever since noon to start for Horobetsu, was very grumpy at having to unpack, and thoroughly disgusted when I told him that I was so tired and bruised that I should have to remain the next day to rest. He said indignantly, I never thought that when you'd got the Kataikushi Kuruma you'd go off the road into those woods. We had seen some deer and many pheasants, and a successful hunter brought in a fine stag, so that I had venison steak for supper, and was much comforted, though Ito seasoned the meal with well-got-up stories of the impracticability of the Volcano Bay route. Shiraoi consists of a large old honjin, or yadoya, 
where the daimyo and his train used to lodge in the old days and about eleven japanese houses most of which are sake shops a fact which supplies an explanation of the squalor of the aino village of fifty-two houses which is on the shore at a respectful distance there is no cultivation in which it is like all the fishing villages on this part of the coast but fish oil and fish manure are made in immense quantities and though it is not the season here the place is pervaded by an ancient and fish-like smell the aino houses are much smaller poorer and dirtier than those of piratori i went into a number of them and conversed with the people many of whom understand japanese some of the houses looked like dens and as it was raining husband wife and five or six naked children all as dirty as they could be with unkempt elf-like locks were huddled round the fires still bad as it looked and smelt the fire was the hearth and the hearth was inviolate and each smoked and dirt-stained group was a family and it was an advance upon the social life of for instance salt lake city the roofs are much flatter than those of the mountain ainos and as there are few storehouses quantities of fish green skins and venison hang from the rafters and the smell of these and the stinging of the smoke were most trying few of the houses had any guest seats but in the very poorest when i asked shelter from the rain they put their best mat upon the ground and insisted much to my distress on my walking over it in muddy boots saying it is i know custom ever in those squalid homes the broad shelf with its rows of japanese couriers always has a place i mention that it is customary for a chief to appoint a successor when he becomes infirm and i came upon a case in point through a mistaken direction which took us to the house of the former chief with a great empty bear cage at its door on addressing him as the chief he said i am old and blind i cannot go out i am of no more good and directed us to the house of his successor altogether it is obvious from many evidences in this village that japanese contiguity is hurtful and that the ainos have reaped abundantly of the disadvantages without the advantages of contact with japanese civilization that night i saw a specimen of japanese horse-breaking as practised in yezo a japanese brought into the village street a handsome spirited young horse equipped with a japanese demi pique saddle and a most cruel gag bit the man wore very cruel spurs and was armed with a bit of stout board two feet long by six inches broad the horse had not been mounted before and was frightened but not the least vicious he was spurred into a gallop and ridden at full speed up and down the street turned by main force thrown on its haunches guarded with the spurs and cowed by being mercilessly thrashed over the ears and eyes with the piece of board till he was blinded with blood whenever he tried to stop from exhaustion he was spurred jerked and flogged till at last covered with steam foam and blood and with blood running from his mouth and splashing the road he reeled staggered and fell the rider dexterously disengaging himself as soon as he was able to stand he was allowed to crawl into a shed where he was kept without food till morning when a child could do anything with him he was broken effectually spirit broken useless for the rest of his life it was a brutal and brutalizing exhibition as triumphs of brute force always are End of section 50of unbeaten tracks in japan by isabella l bird this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by avai in october 2012 letter 39 part 2 this morning i left early in the kuruma with two kind and delightful savages the road being much broken by the rains i had to get out frequently and every time I got in again they put my air-pillow behind me and covered me up in a blanket, and when we got to a rough river 
one made a step of his back by which i mounted their horse and gave me nooses of rope to hold on by and the other held my arm to keep me steady and they would not let me walk up or down any of the hills what a blessing it is that amidst the confusion of tongues the language of kindness and courtesy is universally understood and that a kindly smile on a savage face is as intelligible as on that of one's own countrymen they had never drawn a kuruma and were as pleased as children when i showed them how to balance the shafts they were not without the capacity to originate ideas for when they were tired of the frolic of pulling they attached the kuruma by ropes to the horse which one of them rode at a scramble while the other merely ran in the shafts to keep them level this is an excellent plan horobetsu is a fishing station of antique and decayed aspect with eighteen japanese and forty-seven aino houses the latter are much larger than at shiraoi and their very steep roofs are beautifully constructed it was a miserable day with fog concealing the mountains and lying heavily on the sea but as no one expected rain i sent the kuruma back to mororan and secured horses on principle i always go to the coral myself to choose animals if possible without sore backs but the choice is often between one with a mere raw and others which have holes in their backs into which i could put my hand or altogether uncovered spines the practice does no immediate good but by showing the japanese that foreign opinion condemns these cruelties an amendment may eventually be brought about at horobetsu among twenty horses there was not one that i would take i should like to have had them all shot they are cheap and abundant and are of no account they drove a number more down from the hills and i chose the largest and finest horse i have seen in japan with some spirit and action but i soon found that he had tender feet we shortly left the high road and in torrents of rain turned off on unbeaten tracks which led us through a very bad swamp and some much swollen and very rough rivers into the mountains where we followed a worn-out track for eight miles it was literally foul weather dark and still with a brown mist and rain falling in sheets i threw my paper waterproof away as useless my clothes were of course soaked and it was with much difficulty that i kept my shomon and paper money from being reduced to pulp typhoons are not known so far north as yezo but it was what they call a typhoon rain without the typhoon and in no time it turned the streams into torrents barely fordable and tore up such of a road as there is which has its best as a mere water channel torrents bringing down tolerable sized stones tore down the track and when the horses had been struck two or three times by these it was with difficulty that they could be induced to face the rushing water constantly in a pass the water had gradually cut a track several feet deep between steep banks and the only possible walking place was a stony gash not wide enough for the two feet of a horse alongside of each other down which water and stones were rushing from behind with all manner of trailers matted overhead and between avoiding being strangled and attempting to keep a tender-footed horse on his legs the ride was a very severe one the poor animal fell five times from stepping on stones and in one of his falls twisted my left wrist badly i thought of the many people who envied me my tour in japan and wondered whether they would envy me that ride after this had gone on for four hours the track with a sudden dip over a hillside came down on old mororan a village of thirty aino and nine japanese houses very unpromising looking although exquisitely situated on the rim of a lovely cove the aino huts were small and poor with an unusual number of bear skulls on poles and the village consisted mainly of two long dilapidated buildings in which a number of men were mending nets it looked a decaying place of low mean lives but at a merchant's there was one delightful room with two translucent sides one opening on the village the other looking to the sea down a short steep slope 
on which is a quaint little garden with dwarfed fir trees in pots a few balsams and a red cabbage grown with much pride as a foliage plant it is nearly midnight but my bed and bedding are so wet that i am still sitting up and drying them patch by patch with tedious slowness on a wooden frame placed over a charcoal brazier which has given my room the dryness and warmth which are needed when a person has been for many hours in soaked clothing and has nothing really dry to put on ito bought a chicken for my supper but when he was going to kill it an hour later its owner in much grief returned the money saying she had brought it up and could not bear to see it killed this is a wild outlandish place but an intuition tells me that it is beautiful the ocean at present is thundering up the beach with the sullen force of a heavy ground swell and the rain is still falling in torrents i alby end of section 51fifty two of unbeaten tracks in japan by isabella l bird this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by avai in october two thousand and twelve letter forty part one lebunge volcano bay yezo september six weary wave and dying blast sob and moan along the shore all is peace at last and more than peace it was a heavenly morning the deep blue sky was perfectly unclouded a blue sea with diamond flash and a many twinkling smile rippled gently on the golden sands of the lovely little bay and opposite forty miles away the pink summit of the volcano of komonotaki forming the southwestern point of volcano bay rose into a softening veil of tender blue haze there was a balmy breeziness in the air and tawny tints upon the hill patches of gold in the wood and the scarlet spray here and there heralded the glories of the advancing autumn as the day began so it closed i should like to have detained each hour as it passed it was thorough enjoyment i visited a good many of the mororan ainos saw their well-grown bear in its cage and tearing myself away with difficulty at noon crossed a steep hill and a wood of scrub oak and then followed a trail which runs on the amber sands close to the sea crosses several small streams and passes the lonely aino village of maripu the ocean always on the left and wooded ranges on the right and in front an apparent bar to farther progress in the volcano of Uzutaki, an imposing mountain rising abruptly to a height of nearly three thousand feet i should think in yezo as on the main island one can learn very little about any prospective route usually when one makes an inquiry a japanese puts on a stupid look giggles tucks his thumbs into his girdle hitches up his garments and either professes perfect ignorance or gives one some vague second-hand information though it is quite possible that he may have been over every foot of the ground himself more than once whether suspicion of your motives in asking or a fear of compromising himself by answering is at the bottom of this i don't know but it is most exasperating to a traveller in hakodate i failed to see captain blackiston who has walked round the whole yezo seaboard and all i was able to learn regarding this route was that the coast was thinly peopled by ainos that there were government horses which could be got and that one could sleep where one got them that rice and salt fish were the only food that there were many bad rivers and that the road went over bad mountains that the only people who went that way were government officials twice a year that one could not get on more than four miles a day that the roads over the passes were all big stones etc etc so this uzutaki took me altogether by surprise and for a time confounded all my carefully constructed notions of locality i had been told that the one volcano in the bay was komonotaki near mori and this i believed to be eighty miles off 
and there confronting me within a distance of two miles was this grand splintered vermilion crested thing with a far nobler aspect than that of the volcano with a curtain range in front deeply scored and slashed with ravines and abysses whose purple gloom was unlighted even by the noonday sun one of the peaks was emitting black smoke from a deep crater another steam and white smoke from various rents and fissures in its side vermilion peaks smoke and steam all rising into a sky of brilliant blue and the atmosphere was so clear that i saw everything that was going on there quite distinctly especially when i attained an altitude exceeding that of the curtain range it was not for two days that i got a correct idea of its geographical situation but i was not long in finding out that it was not komonotaki there is much volcanic activity about it i saw a glare from it last night thirty miles away the ainos said that it was a god but did not know its name nor did the japanese who were living under its shadow at some distance from it in the interior rises a grand dome-like mountain shiribetsan and the whole view is grand a little beyond mombetsu flows the river osharu one of the largest of the yezo streams it was much swollen by the previous day's rain and as the ferry-boat was carried away we had to swim it and the swim seemed very long of course we and the baggage got very wet the coolness with which the aino guide took to the water without giving us any notice that its broad eddying flood was a swim and not a ford was very amusing from the top of a steepish ascent beyond the osharugawa there is a view into what looks like a very lovely lake with wooded promontories and little bays and rocky capes in miniature and little heights on which aino houses with tawny roofs are clustered and then the track dips suddenly and deposits one not by a lake at all but on uzu bay an inlet to the pacific much broken up into coves and with a very narrow entrance only obvious from a few points just as the track touches the bay there is a road post with a prayer wheel in it and by the shore an upright stone of very large size inscribed with sanskrit characters near to a stone staircase and a gateway in a massive stone-faced embankment, which looked much out of keeping with the general wildness of the place on a rocky promontory in a wooded cove there is a large rambling house greatly out of repair inhabited by a japanese man and his son who are placed there to look after government interests exiles among five hundred ainos from among the number of red-haunted rambling rooms which had once been handsome i chose one opening on a yard or garden with some distorted use in it but found that the great gateway and the amado had no bolts and that anything might be appropriated by any one with dishonest intentions but the housemaster and his son who have lived for ten years among the ainos and speak their language say that nothing is ever taken and that the ainos are thoroughly honest and harmless without this assurance i should have been distrustful of the number of white-mouthed youths who hung about in the listlessness and vacuity of savagery if not of the bearded men who sat or stood about the gateway with children in their arms uzu is a dream of beauty and peace there is not much difference between the height of high and low water on this coast and the lake-like illusion would have been perfect had it not been that the rocks were tinged with gold for a foot or so above the sea by a delicate species of fucus in the exquisite inlet where i spent the nights trees and trailers drooped into the water and were mirrored in it their green heavy shadows lying sharp against the sunset gold and pink of the rest of the bay log canoes with planks laced upon their gunwales to heighten them were drawn upon a tiny beach of golden sand and in the shadiest cove moored to a tree an antique and much carved junk was floating double wooded rocky knolls with aino huts the vermilion peaks of the volcano of uzutaki redder than ever in the sinking sun 
a few ainos mending their nets, a few more spreading edible seaweed out to dry, a single canoe breaking the golden mirror of the cove by its noiseless motion, a few Aino loungers with their mild-eyed, melancholy faces and quiet ways suiting the quiet evening scene, the unearthly sweetness of a temple bell. This was all, and yet it was the loveliest picture I have seen in Japan. In spite of Ito's remonstrances and his protestations that an exceptionally good supper would be spoiled, I left my rat-haunted room, with its tarnished gilding and precarious fusuma, to get the last of the pink and lemon-coloured glory, going up the staircase in the stone-faced embankment, and up a broad, well-paved avenue to a large temple, within whose open door I sat for some time absolutely alone and in wonderful stillness, for the sweet-toned bell, which vainly chimes for vespers amidst this bare worshipping population, had ceased. This temple was the first symptom of Japanese religion that I remember to have seen since leaving Hakodate, and worshippers have long since ebbed away from its shady and moss-grown courts. Yet it stands there to protest for the teaching of the great Hindu, and generations of Aino heathen pass away one after another, and still its bronze bell tolls, and its altar lamps are lit, and incense burns forever before Buddha. The characters on the great bell of this temple are said to be the same lines which are often graven on temple bells, and to possess the dignity of twenty-four centuries. All things are transient, they being born must die, and being born are dead, and being dead are glad to be at rest. The temple is very handsome, the baldachino is superb, and the bronzes and brasses on the altar are specially fine. A broad ray of sunlight streamed in, crossed the matted floor, and fell full upon the figure of Sakyamuni in his golden shrine, and just at that moment a shaven priest in silk brocaded vestments of faded green silently passed down the stream of light and lit the candles on the altar and fresh incense filled the temple with a drowsy fragrance. It was a most impressive picture. His curiosity evidently shortened his devotions, and he came and asked me where I had been and where I was going, to which, of course, I replied in excellent Japanese, and then stuck fast. Along the paved avenue, besides the usual stone trough for holy water, there are on one side the thousand-armed Kwanon, a very fine relief, and on the other a Buddha throned on the eternal lotus blossom with an iron staff, much resembling a crozier in his hand, and that eternal apathy on his face which is the highest hope of those who hope at all. I went through a wood where there are some mournful groups of graves on the hillside, and from the temple came the sweet sound of the great bronze bell and the beat of the big drum, and then, more faintly, the sound of the little bell and drum, with which the priest accompanies his ceaseless repetition of a phrase in the dead tongue of a distant land. There is an infinite pathos about the lonely temple in its splendour, the absence of even possible worshippers, and the large population of Ainos, sunk in yet deeper superstitions than those which go to make up popular Buddhism. I sat on a rock by the bay, till the last pink glow faded from Uzutaki, and the last lemon stain from the still water, and a beautiful crescent which hung over the wooded hill had set, and the heavens blazed with stars. Ten thousand stars were in the sky, ten thousand in the sea, and every wave with dimpled face that leapt upon the air had caught a star in its embrace and held it trembling there. The loneliness of Uzu Bay is something wonderful, a house full of empty rooms falling to decay with only two men in it, one Japanese house among five hundred savages, Yet it was the only one in which I have slept in which they bolted neither the amado nor the gate. During the night the amado fell out of the worn-out grooves with a crash, knocking down the shoji, which fell on me, 
and rousing ito who rushed into my room half asleep with a vague vision of bloodthirsty ainos in his mind i then learnt what i have been very stupid not to have learnt before that in these sliding wooden shutters there is a small door through which one person can creep at a time called the jishindo or earthquake door because it provides an exit during the alarm of an earthquake in case of the amado sticking in their grooves or the bolts going wrong i believe that such a door exists in all japanese houses the next morning was as beautiful as the previous evening rose and gold instead of gold and pink before the sun was well up i visited a number of the aino lodges saw the bear and the chief who like all the rest is a monogamist and after breakfast at my request some of the old men came to give me such information as they had these venerable elders sat cross-legged in the veranda the housemaster's son who kindly acted as interpreter squatting japanese fashion at the side and about thirty ainos mostly women with infants sitting behind i spent about two hours in going over the same ground as at biratori and also went over the words and got some more including some synonyms the click of the ts before the ch at the beginning of a word is strongly marked among these ainos some of their customs differ slightly from those of their brethren of the interior especially as to the period of seclusion after a death the non-allowance of polygamy to the chief and the manner of killing the bear at the annual festival their ideas of metempsychosis are more definite but this i think is to be accounted for by the influence and proximity of buddhism they spoke of the bear as their chief god and next the sun and fire they said that they no longer worship the wolf and that though they call the volcano and many other things kamoi or god they do not worship them i ascertained beyond doubt that worship with them means simply making libations of sake and drinking to the god and that it is unaccompanied by petitions or any vocal or mental act these ainos are as dark as the people of southern spain and very hairy their expression is earnest and pathetic and when they smiled as they did when i could not pronounce their words their faces had a touching sweetness which was quite beautiful and european not asiatic their own impression is that they are now increasing in numbers after diminishing for many years i left uzu sleeping in the loveliness of an autumn noon with great regret no place that i have seen has fascinated me so much end of section 52